Hello once again and welcome back to the Geodynamics video lectures on plate driving forces. In lecture number four on the topic we're going to talk about an overview of the plate driving forces and then a little bit about the slab pull force. So our goals are basically to introduce the main forces that drive the motions of the tectonic plates and then talk about the slab force, slab pull force in particular uh, as a result of the relatively cold temperature of the slab compared to the surrounding asthenosphere. Now we can talk about a number of different um, plate driving forces and uh, looking at this figure here we can see a variety of plate driving forces that are illustrated and they can basically be divided into two categories those that drive the motions of the plates or make them tend to move and those that resist the motion of the plates. And um, there are some like the drag force that you can see listed on both sides that will depend on the relative motion of the uh, mantle beneath the plate compared to the motion of the plate itself. Um, what we're going to focus on are the ones that are highlighted here in orange and so that's the drag force which again shows up on both sides of the uh, page. The slab pull force which is illustrated here basically this force that pulls the slab down into the asthenosphere and then the ridge push force which you can see up here at relatively high elevations that results in the slab being pushed along uh, and basically gravitationally sliding toward the uh, subduction zone in the figure. Now when we talk about slab pull there's basically two components that we need to consider. First off in general we're talking about a gravitational body force that's acting on the lithospheric slab or plate that's being subducted um, because of its relatively high density compared to the surrounding asthenosphere. Now there's essentially two components to the force. The first being the, um, the component that is the result of the slab being colder than the surrounding mantle. So when it's colder, uh, it's uh, relatively dense then as a result and will tend to sink for that reason. And there's another component that has to do with the phase transition and, um, and we'll talk about that in the next video lecture. But in general we could simply say that the slab pull force is the combination of the relatively cold slab component plus the phase transition component. And we'll look at the slab temperature component in this lecture here. Now in the Turcotte and Schubert textbook, they go through the math to essentially get you to this relationship here where we can say that um, for one half of a sinking mantle plume, the Fb, the uh, body force, is equal to this rather lengthy combination of terms here on the right. And so you can see here a reference density, which we've seen before, rho naught, gravitational acceleration, volumetric expansion, alpha, the B, which is again going to be the thickness of the fluid you're considering, TC, which is that um, temperature in this case at the center of the convecting uh, cell, and T naught then would be the temperature at the lithosphere, asthenosphere boundary, so it's at the top of the uh, asthenosphere. U naught and V naught are um, velocities. U naught is the horizontal velocity of the upper layer, so that would be the motion of the uh, overlying lithosphere essentially, and then V naught would be the um, average vertical velocity. And you can see in here the um, thermal diffusivity. Lambda in this case is a little bit of a different definition. It's the width of two convection cells, um, and then that's divided by 2 pi times that horizontal velocity again, and that whole term is taken to the one-half power. So that's a little bit of a lengthy relationship, and there are a few things in there that we don't necessarily know, but we can simplify a little bit um, by making some kind of general um, simplifications to the geometry of the system. Okay, so if we want to estimate this slab pull force, we can make things a little easier on ourselves. The first simplification we can make has to do with the geometry of the convecting cell, and that is that we'll assume that 
the velocities are going to increase away from the center of the convecting cell. So here where the cursor is located is the center of this simplified convection cell and uh, you can see that as you go vertically up or down the horizontal components of the velocity are linearly increasing in this convection cell so it's in this case convecting in a clockwise direction and if you go horizontally you'll see increasing or um, decreasing vertical velocities um, as you move away again from the center. And because these velocities in this case are increasing linearly in this simplified convection cell it's very easy to see that there's basically a built-in conservation of mass where uh, the area of horizontal motion in both of these cases is balanced by the area of vertical motion. In other words, v naught times lambda over 2 is equal to u naught times b. And so we have conserved mass uh, directly in the way that we've assumed our simplified convection cell is flowing. Now, um, if we also assume the sinking slab is rigid, which is a reasonable assumption, we can say that u naught is equal to v naught, and by doing that, the relationship again gets a little bit um, simpler, and we can calculate the force that results from the slab being colder than the surrounding mantle as being uh, something of an easier um, combination of terms than what we saw before. We still have this reference density, rho naught, g, coefficient of volumetric expansion, thickness of the fluid, the center at the temperature, or temperature at the center of the convection cell minus the uh, temperature at the top of the fluid that the lithosphere is thenosphere boundary, and then diffusivity, the two times the width of the convection cell divided by two pi times the horizontal velocity. So here you can see all we need to know is the horizontal velocity, which is actually something we can calculate based on the plate motions, or at least estimate based on plate motions. And so the relationship then obviously is a little bit simpler. If you plug in typical numbers, then what you come up with here is a component of this force that's about three times 10 to the 13 newtons per meter. And so this is, um, a value that's going to be a force per meter of trench length. Okay, so that's going to, that is what the uh, newtons per meter is uh, coming from, and that's why it's not simply just newtons, but it's on the order of 3 times 10 to the 13 newtons per meter. And just maybe have that number in mind for some of the upcoming video lectures where we'll look at the magnitude of some of the other plate driving forces. Okay, so that's it for this one. And uh, when we come back, we'll talk about the slab pull force as a result of the olivine to spinel phase transition. So go ahead and take your quiz, and I'll see you for the next one.